Stan and I first met each other, I don't know, 25, 30 years ago at a dendrochronology workshop in the Andrews Forest, which is on the east wet side of the Cascades where you've got dug fir that are 200, 250 uh, feet tall. And I don't know what happened to us because he went back to work with these real scraggly pinion juniper since, and I went to the kind of, you know, the scrubby looking uh, western juniper. So I don't know if those dug firs scared us or what. Afraid of heights. I appreciate the work that, uh, or the uh, introduction material that uh, Rick and Patty have given us so far. I hope to add a little bit to that for the different perspective. I, in my heart of hearts, I'm a dendrochronologist. Anytime, Patty, you have an opportunity to core trees and, uh, and, and look at those tree rings, do it. I want to start today, make sure I'm doing this right, okay, with, uh, with a publication that came out first in 2008 and later in Rangeland Ecology and Management in 2009. A synthesis, it's an interesting group of authors, uh, Rick being one of them here, that, that should warn you right to begin with a little bit about what we're uh, dealing with, but the, this group of, of authors have quite variable views on, on a lot of topics, but they're all experienced and knowledgeable in, in pinyon juniper woodlands, they just have a little bit different perspectives. And this was a consensus document that uh, in which we try to, to uh, address some generalizations, some uh, uh, things that hold true for pinyon juniper um, over time. And, and so that's one of the things that, that uh, is covered in the document is an attempt to classify pinyon juniper, uh, pinyon juniper communities or, or woodlands into some very generalized types. And I'm gonna address three of those types here. First is uh, persistent pinyon juniper woodlands. Um, according to the, the document, uh, it talks about soil, climate, and disturbance regimes that favor one or more species of pinyon and juniper. Um, uh, density of trees may vary. Uh, and typically, we think of places where understory herbaceous cover is generally fairly sparse. Uh, we've already seen some exceptions to that here today, and I, I appreciate that, uh, that window into the complexity of what it, what it uh, takes to classify these things. Um, uh, it's generally acknowledged that these persistent woodlands are widespread and that they're perhaps uh, most prominent in the Colorado Plateau. A second type are pinyon juniper savannas also has been mentioned at this point. In, these, in this case, soil and climate conditions uh, favor grasses, but uh, shrubs and, and trees can also occur with those at variable uh, densities. Um, uh, tree age may vary, replacement may vary, but uh, typically it's fairly slow. Uh, we think of places where the terrain is, is, is um, uh, pretty gentle, uh, often deep soils, and particularly where the summer precipitation is more reliable. So this type is most prominent in the southwest. Uh, a third type described in the publication are wooded shrublands. It's, it was a term that I had to, to work at getting used to what that is exactly. But uh, I, right now I'm sticking with what the publication said. Uh, soil and climate conditions favor shrub-dominated communities, but again, trees occur from low to high densities, uh, subject to woodland expansion and contraction over time, and you have to think of variable time frames as far as this is concerned, both uh, above and below the persistent woodland belt. Uh, so uh, we may see more pinion above that belt and juniper below that belt. Tree density, again, is uh, regulated by climate as well as uh, disturbance regimes. Herbaceous component can be variable, and uh, it's widespread, according to publications, most prominent in the, um, in the Great Basin. In addition, uh, before I go there, I put this question mark up on the screen because, I'm, I, I, as you'll see as I go through, I, 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 I'm not entirely comfortable with this title of wooded shrublands and whether or not it, it adequately describes a place such as pictured here on this slide with uh, a mountain big sagebrush and some relatively young pinyon juniper. Is that truly, uh, a, a, is it a shrubland, is it a woodland, is it some kind of a hybrid in between? What, what are we really talking about? I'll get back to that. The publication also addresses disturbance regimes, particularly fire within pinyon and juniper woodlands. Um, the generalized statements that I gleaned from the document are as follows. The high frequency, low intensity fire had a very limited role. Most fires kill most trees within fire perimeters. That's a tough one there, huh? 
Fire frequency varied, but for many locations, fire-free intervals can be measured in hundreds to thousands of years. And oftentimes, non-fire disturbances like drought and in insects and disease are more important drivers of stand dynamics than fire for many pin and juniper woodlands. So that's our starting place. You, this is finally to the title of my presentation, Historical Composition, Demographics, and Fire Regimes for Pinion Juniper Vegetation in Utah and Eastern Nevada. It sounds a lot like the title of the publication, except over a, a, small, a smaller geography, limiting ourselves primarily to Utah and a little bit of Eastern Nevada, and it su suggests that our interest was to um, uh, perhaps revisit some of the generalizations of that publication, and that is indeed the, the case, but uh, using actual data to test that. So uh, the, the study uh, published as a GTR that I make reference to is uh, an, an effort in, in which we sampled 16 different gridded sites, or there were, uh, plots were placed upon uh, on these 16 different sites, uh, 19 sites total, but three of them weren't gridded, so I'm not going to be referring to those. Um, in Utah and one in, in, in Nevada, where we uh, laid out plot grids, such as in these two examples, from low elevation to high elevation within small watersheds. The grid, the uh, inner plot distances is generally 500 meters. Sometimes the exact location of the plot was, was moved because of a road or being on a ridge top or on rock, an unsafe location, that kind of a thing. But generally speaking, at 500 meter intervals, um, we took plot data within and between plots, we opportunistically sampled fire scarred trees to augment whatever f uh, fire occurrence data that we could uh, uh, put together from f uh, with uh, w what we found in the plots themselves. Um, the particular arrangement of these plots was molded to fit the, the landscape that we had. And so you see two different examples here, again, with the intent to get a, a, a broad elevational uh, uh, coverage as, as well as and, and cover the representation of the vegetation that was present. So it's pretty simple. We come to a plot that the um, uh, plot centers were predetermined. We find them with a GPS um, handheld device. Uh, and then the steady trees were the 30 trees that were closest to the plot center. We'd measure that distance whether they were live trees, snags, logs on the ground, sometimes stumps, uh, they, were, they became a study tree until we had reached 30 trees. That, that became the plot. So it's a variable radius plot. We took uh, basic uh, 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 metrics on, on the trees and, of course, the species and uh, the status, whether they're alive or dead, or what kind of a, of a, a tree we were looking at. As, and then we would either uh, core uh, or um, uh, take a cross-section of those trees in order to get uh, uh, chronological history of the period of time in which the, the, tri uh, the tree had lived uh, or was currently living. It's when the tree was initiated or approximation uh, for a germination date, uh, at least as close to that as we could. Uh, if as a fire scarred tree, we took a partial cross section as illustrated here so that we could uh, date to annual accuracy the, the years in which fires occurred. Um, and then we noted the presence of charred remnants as well as uncharred remnants in the plot. So we get uh, kind of just a general feeling for the, act, uh, the presence of fire within the, within the plot. So we did this uh, on uh, uh, the 16 different sites, a total of 405 plots. Um, a little over 12,000 trees were cored or, or cross-sectioned. About 80% of those uh, were successfully cross-dated. So uh, close to, t uh, close to, to uh, 10,000 trees uh, is, is the data reference that I'm, that I'm using here. Uh, approximately 1,200 of those trees had fire scars, including the trees that were found between plots, and about 80% of those also were cross-dated with, uh, with the uh, date of the fires being um, uh, accurately or assessed to, to, uh, to the, the, year, the specific year of the fire, sometimes to the season of. So using all of that information now, particularly uh, the plot composition and uh, age structure, uh, it was our intent uh, for this particular uh, uh, presentation and part of the work uh, that focused on pinion juniper to classify the, 
those plots. And we used a very liberal classification to call it a, a pinion juniper plot. If it had at least 10% of the live trees had pinion, were pinion or juniper, it was classified as, as a potentially a pinion juniper plot. If 90% if, uh, if, if of the trees were pinion or juniper, and at least some of the trees dated to before 1860, we, we classified those as persistent woodland or pers persistent pinion juniper woodland. If it was less than 90%, and anywhere between then 10 and 90% were our pinion and juniper species, and some of the trees date to before 1860, then we, we uh, assign them a, a, a classification of woodland dry forest mix. Um, and those were further subdivided depending on the the uh, prominence of pinion and juniper species, they could be uh, pinion juniper dominant, co-dominant, or subdominant. And finally, on those plots where none of the trees were as, uh, or remnants were as old as uh, 1860, uh, um, and that's a fairly arbitrary date cutoff, but you have to pick something, uh, then we classify these as expansion woodland, or perhaps this is, uh, cor corresponds well to this wooded shrubline concept from the publication. So if we, if we look at, uh, of our 405 plots, 22% uh, or 88 of the plots were classified as, pin as pinion juniper woodland plots. Um, 33 of those plots were classified as persistent PJ woodland from seven different sites. Um, the woodland dry forest mixed plots, we had 44 and uh, they were found in 11 different sites, and then there were four sites where we, where we sampled what we called expansion woodland for a total of 88 plots that the rest of this discussion is, uh, the emphasis is on, on those 88 plots. If we look at the distribution in, of those, uh, the dominance types, the, the pinion juniper dominant, co-dominant and subdominant. By definition, the persistent woodlands are always pinion juniper dominant, but of the woodland dry forest mix and the woodland expansion types, they're all three are represented to some degree uh, in, in terms of pinion juniper dominant, co-dominant, or subdominant. So in addition, this is a pretty busy slide, so I'll, I'll, I'll summarize it best as I can. In addition to these the vegetation classifications, we were interested in, in assigning some sort of a fire regime classification for each of the plots. We have five classifications here, and I'll just, again, I will generalize, read as, as hard and fast as you want if, you, if what I say is, an, is inadequate, or we can talk later. The fire regime class one is a case in which fire is, is rare, perhaps extremely rare, and when it does occur, it has relatively low impacts, uh, such as um, uh, very small patch burns or uh, two or three trees burn with a lightning strike, that kind of thing. The, the fuels just aren't dense enough to carry a fire in, in most cases. Uh, we identify these sites by the presence of very old trees, um, lack of synchrony in, the, in recruitment and mortality, lack of evidence of fire uh, char or otherwise on, on the site. Um, the second class also has very long uh, fire return intervals of hundred, uh, hundreds to perhaps thousands of years, uh, at least very long in, in, in time. But when fire does occur, it's a high impact fire, kind of a spreading crown fire kind of a thing that we typically see oftentimes in pinion jun juniper woodlands today. Um, we uh, distinguish this type in the historical record based upon the presence of char uh, and the synchrony in, in the establishment and, and mortality of trees, and particularly when there's lack of overlap between cohorts. A third class is kind of intermediate. Uh, it's, uh, some would think of this in terms of a mixed severity. Uh, it, we could also think of intermediate uh, uh, fire return intervals from decades to hundreds of years long. Uh, still, we see these establishment cohorts, but there's a lot of overlap among the cohorts. cohorts. Sometimes we see fire scarred trees and we oftentimes find char uh, on the ground, charred remnants. A fourth class is is uh, when you think of ponderosa pine uh, fire, uh, uh, classical ponderosa pine uh, uh, fire regime with high frequency, low severity, kind of surface fires uh, on the ground, uh, often in, measured in the intervals and measured in a few years to perhaps a few decades in between fire events. The fire tolerant species like ponderosa pine that are mature trees often will survive many many different fires without, with, without harm. Uh, fire sensitive trees like pinion and juniper uh, don't, don't t generally do so well, though we can find fire scar trees of both, uh, both those groups. And, um, and so um, 
typically, our pinyon juniper trees are, are, uh, are only young in these plots. And then the fifth class is uh, I, I, kind of a catch-all where fire regimes are unknown, but it's assumed that there is sufficient fire to help keep trees off the site. These are those expansion areas. So uh, my time is getting short, so I'm going to go through this quickly. Each of these boxes represent a plot. The horizontal lines within the box are each individual trees. So you get, provide a chronology for each of those. Uh, the different colors represent different species of trees. The kind of yellow is, is pinion and the more orange is, is, is juniper. Uh, little uh, inverted triangles are uh, fire scars corresponding to specific, specific years. And the gray bands uh, that may or may not show up real well show where there's sufficient synchrony and establishment that we call it a cohort. The, the black star is in, an indication that charred remnants were found in the plot. Using these data, first of all, we uh, uh, black out or gray out those plots that don't, don't qualify as pinion juniper plots. Um, and, from, and then for, of the rest of the plots, we uh, identify four, this is on one particular site, the, the uh, Wawa Mountain site in the Great Basin, four plots were classified as persistent um, woodland and four sites, uh, four plots that were woodland dry forest mix. In addition to this, we, we uh, classify two of these uh, persistent woodlands as fire class one and two as fire class two based upon the fire evidence and the remaining four were fire class three that correspond to the woodland dry forest mix. Look at a different site. This is in the, the book cliff, so from the Colorado Plateau site. Uh, this is some of their plots, not all of them. Again, persistent woodlands where pinyon juniper dominate and are uh, uh, old enough that they're we consider them persistent uh, plots. Uh, woodland dry forest mix plots. Fire class one uh, was abundant on this in this area, as well as fire class two, and some fire class three present. A little bit different site on Boulder Mountain, on the lower elevations of Boulder Mountain, uh, persistent woodlands and woodland dry forest mix, again, are, are both represented. Uh, fire class one is represented, fire class two, fire class four is that one in which ponderosa pine is, is uh, uh, or other fire tolerant species are present. We see a lot more evidence of, of high frequency fire and most of the pinion and, or juniper are young in age. And the uh, fourth site, this is on the Snake Range in eastern Nevada. Uh, three, of the, three of the plots were persistent woodlands and three were expansion woodland. You can see from the young ages of the trees present. Uh, one that was classified as fire class one, two as fire as class three, and three as fire class five, those corresponding to the expansion woodlands. So across all sites, this is kind of what it looks like for the persistent pinyon juniper woodland. Uh, the uh, um, um, fire class one is the dominant type, but it's also the most important uh, vegetation type for fire class two. If we look at the woodland dry forest mix, uh, clearly fire class three, kind of the mixed severity, mixed intermediate, uh, frequency fire is, is the prominent type, and it's the only uh, vegetation type in which we observed fire class four, that ponderosa uh, pine type. And if, by definition, expansion woodlands will have uh, fire class uh, uh, five. So before we jump to too much conclusions, let's understand what our study caveats might be here. First of all, sampling was not designed to be proportionally representative at the regional scale, especially for woodlands. Gentle slopes, lower elevations, slick rock, savanna, or largely tre treeless areas were undersampled or intentionally excluded. Ages could not be determined for many sample trees, especially for some junipers, because we cross-date, not simply count rings. And uh, so, so uh, sometimes our ages are, are, are not, exa not exact in terms of, of uh, what we were dealing with. And finally, boundaries between stand types and fire regime classifications are somewhat arbitrary and certainly artificial, masking the broad spectrum of conditions that exist among within and within classifications. So what can we say in regards to persistent woodlands? Well, the generalizations in that publication referred to earlier were, were largely confirmed. This type is widespread. It's typically old growth in nature. Uh, fire class one and two predominate, though we did see some fire class three as well. As far as the woodland dry forest mix, 
Uh, this is a type that is, is not even recognized in that publication, and, and I guess if there's any take-home message I would have here today is a type that needs to be recognized. Uh, it's more than just a narrow ecotone between woodlands and, and dry forest type. Um, it's, a, it's distinct in terms of its um, fire, uh, uh, this disturbance regimes and age class distribution, it, uh, it, and it's often found ac across rather broad um, spatial scales, uh, sometimes whole watersheds, uh, are, this is the type that dominate. Persistent uh, um, forest types that have a combination of pinyon juniper woodlands and, and trees. So as far as the woodland shrubland question, we didn't, we didn't uh, uh, run into persistent wooded shrublands in our, in our, our, our study. Um, there's almost no evidence of pre-1860 trees were found in, in these expansion areas. And so I would suggest that the expansion woodland is perhaps a better term than a wooded shrubland. And I don't have time, I know that, because when they, he stands up, it means I'm done. So thank you. <laughs>